Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. Are we on Tuesday? We are on Tuesday. It's Tuesday edition. And I just lose track of time over here. It's the Tuesday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. Yes, I'm sure some of you are going, what the hell is going on with your FRC? Merlin down 50% on the day. A little bit underwater with that one, but we have until Friday to figure out how bad the pain really is by Friday. Um, today, we're going to talk about spread trading. We've actually talked about this in the past, but I wanted to revisit it because Brandon is uh, one of those guys that's always improving content, always implementing new things and strategies and tactics to make things better and better and better, which to me is the hallmark of a professional trader. You realize, hey, there's things I need to do to make my style better, you know, learn from other people, add little pieces here and there. So today, we are going to talk with Brandon Wendell about spread trading. As you can see here, yes, that is uh, his uh, cameo picture from the latest Pixar movie. You nailed it there, Bob. Pretty pretty damn good. Uh, uh, figuring out that that was his Pixar shot. Anyway, uh, joining me today from the wonderful state of Florida, which always seems to have a bad rap on the news, Mr. Brandon Wendell. Brandon, how you doing? I'm doing great, Merlin. Thanks for having me back. It's been a while since we've had you on the program, my friend. It is good, definitely yeah. good to have you back. Uh, you survived the storms out there in Florida, huh? Yeah, yeah, we had a little minor flooding, but you know, we've we fared much better than most people. So I'm very fortunate and thankful. Yes. Uh, one word of advice: a car is not the same as a boat, and apparently, you needed a boat so your car stopped in the water, right? Yeah, I had the SUV. <laughs> we made it pretty far, but then couldn't get all the way through it all. So yeah, it happens. You, you need know. to get one of those little snorkel it's things that pops out of your car and goes all the way, so you can just <laughs> truck through that water when you get those crazy floods. Yeah, that's just, that's you know what insurance is for. So we're good. We're all covered. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, Geico doesn't want to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about spread trading. Obviously, you you have a variety of different styles and techniques that you do, and we could have talked about a variety of different things as well, but I thought let's go into spread trading because people ask me about it quite regularly on the show. I don't do it myself, uh, but you do, and you do it well, and I uh, figured maybe you could share that background, maybe how you got into it, and then what is spread trading, and then show us how it works. All right. Um, I got into it just uh... – I'm always uh, curious about the markets and what I can do to try to improve myself, as you said, to get better as a trader and better as a person as well. And I just uh, kind of happened upon it. I don't even remember exactly how I got involved, but I thought, wow, this is kind of neat. It's it's a way of trading where you are, in a way, directionless, which sometimes I am as well. So it works out really well. Uh, <laughs> but you know, instead of being a directional trader in futures where you're looking for markets to go up or down – you can uh, not worry about that. You basically become what's called delta neutral. I do want to make a note, though. A lot of people get confused with future spread trading. They start to think about options, and this has nothing to do with options. We are not trading options. We are simply trading two futures against each other, one against the other to profit from price changes between the two. So it's, a, it's kind of a different way of doing it. And I got involved, oh man, probably over 10 years ago. And I uh, just did it for a while on my own and then realized that there was a need where people were interested in learning this to both reduce risks and costs as well as profit in different market environments. So mm -hmm. I decided to start teaching it and sharing my knowledge with other people. Nice. Well, there you go. Yeah, it's... Um... It's an interesting one, and you're right. I'm glad you made the distinction there that it's not the same as options trading, spread trading and options. I would argue is probably a bit easier, but uh, the future side of things, you know, since you have these options or futures contracts that expire quarterly or monthly, depending on which futures product you're looking at, um, you can look at two different maturities there on those expirations of those futures contracts, and you're basically ar like arbitraging the difference between the two. Right. I mean, it could be two related securities like the Dow and the NASDAQ, right. or it could be the same security with two different maturities, as you were saying, different expirations. So you could do NASDAQ June versus NASDAQ December. And um, yeah, you're basically, as you said, you're trying to profit from mispricing or changes in relationships between those two. Now, do you have a favorite set that you go with? And you just mentioned, and normally I think when most people think of spread trading with futures, it's going to be looking at the same instrument just different maturities, but you just mentioned real quickly S and P versus the Dow or something like that. Um, do you have a, a select group that you like to stick with? Because I know, you know, for example, I have a lot of traders that come on this program and, and they'll be like, "Oh, I just trade, you know, the the E minis. That's it. I'm just trading the E minis, or I'm just trading, you know, agricultural commodities, or I'm just trading this." Is there a group that you kind of gravitate towards with regards to spread trading? That you say that's where my wheelhouse is. Uh, I, not really. Um, 
honestly, there's a couple different ways of trading them. The, the two we mentioned are just called intra-market, which you mentioned is the most common one that people think of, where you're trading the same security against itself, just different expirations. And then you have inter-market, which is related securities. So I basically an opportunist. I, I There's two main ways that I try to trade. One is called seasonality where certain times of the year, certain spreads are more in favor and they tend to repeat patterns over and over and over again. So I look for these seasonal patterns and try to exploit them, knowing that you know crude oil might rally during a certain time of the year. We can trade crude oil versus crude oil, or I could trade crude oil versus the refined product like gasoline. And it may do a certain move over and over and over again almost every single year, almost the exact same time. Uh, so we can do that. But then also, I still apply a lot of the core strategy that I use for my charting into my trading. And I actually do search one of my favorite strategies that I came up with many years ago is called the 889 trading strategy. A lot of my students are aware of what that is. And I apply that to the intermarket. It doesn't work as well on intra. So I use it on intermarkets and I just scan for the opportunities. So either seasonality, looking for those patterns to repeat, or simply looking at charts to move the way we would normally. Uh, for viewers out there, explain intra versus intermarket, just, just to, for clarity. Sure. Actually, if uh, let me go ahead and share my screen if I can. Of course uh, you can. Yep. You have the power. There we go. So, uh, for instance, if I think the NASDAQ is going to move, you know, we can take a look at the NASDAQ. This is the NASDAQ chart. Let me clean it up. I happen to be on a daily time frame. And we can, you know, if we think the NASDAQ is going to continue downwards or, okay, let's just say we're going to continue downwards. I'll keep it simple. Uh, we have the ability to either sell the NASDAQ futures and trade that to the downside. Now, first of all, the margin for that, if I could find, there it is, margin calculator. Oops, 23. There we go. If you're going to trade one contract overnight, and I'll zoom in on that. Hopefully you can see this better you got the overnight margin of $18,480, which for some people, no big deal. You just put it on the trade. Other people, that's going to be a problem. Obviously, the alternative would be perhaps to trade the micro to reduce your risk and reduce your cost. So if it updates, $1,848 overnight. Wow, okay, yeah. So big difference, obviously, between the micro and the full size. But here's the other thing we can do. We can trade the NASDAQ June contract versus the December contract. So I'll set up that chart like this. I'll simply take the NQM minus NQZ 2023. And what we're looking at now looks a little weird. I'll actually do it as a line chart instead. We are simply subtracting the price of December versus the June contract. And that's the difference between the two. And you can see it moves back and forth. Mm -hmm. So we can take advantage of that and... Uh, perhaps if it's down here near negative 520, we would buy the June contract and sell the December. Now, if we think the markets are going to go down from where they are right now, and we're sitting right here at negative 283, you think about it, which one would move the fastest, the, the front month contract or the back month? Are you quizzing me on this one? Sure. Yeah. Putting you on the spot there. Well, which one I do you think would move the furthest and fastest, the front month with all the volume or the back month? I think the front month. Of course, yeah. The front month has more volume. It'll move much faster typically. So we could sell that front month, but at the same time, buy the back month. Now, if the market goes up, both of those will probably rise and you won't lose any money. But if you shorted just the NASDAQ June contract, you would have lost money, mm -hmm. right? So if it does go down and you're right, because there's more volume and more trading on that June contract, it's likely to move down further and faster. And that would cause that chart to drop. And because you were short on that contract, you'd make more money than what you would lose on the contract you are long. And that is an intra market spread. So you know, I can put in the text here intra. Uh, let me do it this way intra market is basically the same security with different months. And you could do this, as I was saying, sometimes seasonally or often people will do this as a replacement for trying to hold the security overnight. You know, we saw the margin, let me go back to the full size contract here, overnight for that June contract, just as short as 18 grand. But at the same time, if we do 
NQZ23. And again, we're going to short that contract. I'll zoom in again. Look at the margin. Yeah. $935. So you went from an $18,000 um, commitment to under a thousand bucks to hold overnight. Now you won't make as much money, okay, as just shorting the contract, but you've reduced your cost. And if you did these both as the micro, I mean, you can really reduce your risk and cost as well. So we do the micro versus the micro. And now the overnight margin is $94 to hold the, both of those contracts in spread. So that's one reason why a lot of people do these because it reduced your costs and obviously it'll reduce the amount of profit you could potentially make too. You see there's not gigantic moves, but you know, negative 273 and about 560, we're looking at about 250 points of movement, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not a math whiz, but 250 points times $20 a point, that's a $5,000 move right there. And that happened basically in about one, two days using less than a thousand dollars right and i think that's that, pretty incredible when you think about it yeah and i think that the the point th uh, that needs to be made here is yes you're not necessarily going to get those grand slams because you're using that second leg of it um in this case something that's not like a counter spread <laughs> you're using that second part of it which hedges your position a little bit again you're not going to get as much profit as you normally would have but you're also limiting your losses as well but the right. bigger point here is instead of that 18 grand I'm now going in with $900. So while you're thinking you're not making a lot of money on it, the rate of return is actually higher than going directional. Right, exactly. So the other one is the inter-market spreads, which is different securities and sometimes same month, sometimes different months. Mm -hmm. So in this case, let me go back to a candlestick chart. And I got a watch list that I, I keep an eye out for. Inter-market spreads. There we go. And, you know, I mentioned my 889 strategy. I'll bring that up. And there we go. So right now I have the continuous contracts, corn versus soybeans, and I can look for these trade opportunities. I mean, when you look at it, the charting is almost the same as what you would do for looking just at a corn chart. Mm -hmm. But I'm trading the difference in price between corn and soybeans. And again, you know, if we do this intermarket spread, even the NASDAQ example that I had previously, let me go back to that. So here's the NASDAQ once again. And again, I'll zoom in so you can see this better. But we're going to do the Dow. YMM23. So, of course, the NASDAQ by itself overnight, $18,000. But if you do the Dow as a spread where you buy one NASDAQ and sell one Dow, you can actually hold both of those for 14,000. Mm -hmm. So it reduces that margin again. This is not a huge reduction, but it's definitely something. And if I do the agricultural product we were just looking at, which is corn, what is 23? There we go. And soybeans. There we go. Now, first, let me take off the soybeans and just the corn itself overnight is about $1,900 for margin. But as a spread, $2,269 for both of those. So you're able to carry, in this case, it's a little bit higher than just one. Right. But again, this is a trade that you would not be able to do simply by trading only corn. So we're getting a, an opportunity to trade the price difference between two related securities this way. You know, for me, and I'm I'm definitely in, this is getting into the soybeans and corn spreads is way beyond my level of capacity. I'd you know, those ones I'd probably go directionally, but for me, I would definitely be sticking to the probably the same index you know that you had on there earlier, like the Nasdaq, and going the September to the December contract and ma mapping those differences out there. Um, comment came in from Pepe says rate of return calculated with the margin or with the stop size. Um, I think we're looking at the rate of return with regards to the amount of capital that you have to put up for the potential rate of return. Correct. And that would be the margin. So when you're talking rate of return, yes, that's, yeah. Uh, if you're worried about your rate of return based on risk, then that would be using the stop size. And of course, you can maintain proper stops. You know, when I go through these lists, actually, yeah, I can just run through these and I could do this on different time frames. This is the Australian dollar versus the euro. Um, so for instance, if I look, eh, maybe we've got a little supply zone here. If we return to that area, 
there may be an opportunity. I also want to point something else out here. You can't just trade one contract versus the other when you're charting. You got to be a bit careful. We have something called notional value. And what we're looking at in a typical chart, for instance, again, I'll use the NASDAQ because that's an easy example for most people to understand. So if we look at the NASDAQ, just the NASDAQ by itself, that 12,809.50, that's the market price. That's not the value of the contract, right? That's just the price that everybody's getting (laughs) quoted. That's what you would buy or sell at. The actual value or what we call notional value is that number, the market value, multiplied by the point value. So in this case, let's see, where's my calculator? We're looking at 12,809.50 times 20 points. Notional value is $256,000 for one NASDAQ contract. Houses. Yeah. So I'm, when, you, when you're doing these, let me do the Dow versus the NASDAQ. Right here is Dow versus NASDAQ. Okay. And again, I'll clean up my chart. What I have here is notional value. Actually, no, I don't. Ah, this one's incorrect, actually. I got to fix this. Fix notional value. <clears throat> it should have been. <laughs> uh, every point on the Dow is worth five bucks. Every point on the NASDAQ is worth $20. So that is the notional value. And the reason why you use notional value, it's much easier to figure out your rewards and your risk. For instance, if I was going to short here, you know, we have negative 77, 425, negative 80, 825. You just figure out the difference. So literally, if I put my stop at the high there, we're doing 80, 825 minus 77, 425. And I know it's $3,400 of risk. (laughs) So if I didn't do notional value, if I did it this way, it's interesting that. that the way you have it set up with notional value gives you, you know, the actual dollar amount stop loss. So, you know, most people have to, you're doing a zone, you have to calculate, okay, this price, I'm this price times the quantity of shares, and it makes it more complicated in some situations. This seems pretty easy. Exactly. Yeah, we're trying to keep it simple. I mean, right. it, trading can be difficult enough. There we go. That's why it, this is the wrong one. So again, yeah, if I did a zone, I would have to calculate how much risk and reward do I have by multiplying by point values, all this other stuff. And you want to do that, just keep it simple. So that's what I do is I definitely use the notional value with these. If I can find that one I was looking at again, I don't know where it went. <laughs> I can bring it up again later. Yeah, you got a lot of stuff on there. What's your yeah. your typical time frame for these trades? I'm assuming this is swing trading, so a couple of days, a couple of weeks. Yeah, it varies. Um, it could be anywhere from a, a week. You know, again, if I go down to smaller time frames, I can actually spread trade. I typically only use a four hour time frame, and it's the smallest. But you could actually do this intraday. I mean, if you really want to go crazy, you can go to a five-minute chart and trade these movements intraday. And when you think about it, the related, especially, again, the equity indices, when you look at them intraday, and this is a five-minute chart of the four major equity indices, if I go back to the beginning of the day, well, really the opening bell, if you will, for regular trading hours around 9.30, I can find it. Almost there. There it is. It's 9.30. You can see they, yeah, they move together, but there are times where they separate. So for instance, at 10.40 this morning, you could have bought the Russell and shorted the Dow, expecting them to come back together. And sure enough, they did. Look at that. So you could have done an intra intermarket, intraday trade, say that 10 times fast, uh, to be able to profit on that potential move where they came back together. And it's not normally done this way. Normally, we are looking at trades that are going to last anywhere from about a week to several months on average. You know, there's different services out there you can go to that do try to identify the um, the seasonal spreads I was talking about. And they're often looking at larger timeframes. So, Got to love that Google and Microsoft earnings popping up that NASDAQ in the after hours. That's nice. Yeah. (laughs) Going on right there. Yeah. Big time. <clears throat> all right, so predominantly you're doing with agricultural product. Well, not agri. You're pretty much doing no. this all futures. Is there is there a a limitation? Because I know there there's. I remember a while back. I think when we first talked about this, there were a lot of platforms that wouldn't allow you to do spread trading. So you had to kind of find a specific platform for. Is that still the case? No, there's actually quite a few that do. Um, you know, I I work a lot with um, Trade Pro Futures. You know, Trey, yeah, of course. Trade Pro, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And he handles it pretty well. I'm actually, I've got my accounts. I can link, you know, to the charting package to that. I use this Omega charts, which I have behind here. And you can link that account directly to your trade pro if you want to, or um, 
Thinkorswim isn't great because they only do intra-market. They don't do a lot of inter-market spreads. Uh, TradeStation, you got TradeStation Futures Plus that you have to use. So you mm-hmm. have to use their special software for it. But um, no, for, I mean, it's it's opened up a lot more than it used to be. There are definitely not a lot of retail traders like ourselves who are doing a lot of spreads, but it's definitely growing in popularity. So no, it's it's much easier. And uh, um, you know, I saw a question that popped up that somebody was asking about the laws of supply and demand still apply to these charts. Absolutely, they do. Yeah, I mean, when you saw me looking at some of these as I scroll through, uh, it's already popped. But I will look for supply and demand zones to identify where to get in, where to get out. You know, irregardless of the time frame. Like I said, I can do all the way down to. I I don't do too many sixty minute trades because the charts don't look as good, but. I will do four hour time frames or daily and simply look for trend as well as supply and demand zones. Absolutely. So looking at these different charts, I'm still not seeing anything great yet. I do a lot of currency trades as well with when this. You, when you look at the spreads here, you know, you said you're not finding anything great. What are you looking for specifically on these charts? In this particular case, for my 889 strategy, I'm looking for prices to basically it, it, it it's kind of a uh a lazy way of identifying the third wave of an Elliott wave move. And I'm looking for a demand zone that prices are likely to come back to that correlates with the 89 exponential moving average, basically. So for instance here, oh, this might be something. What am I on? S&P versus Russell. And right here we have rally base rally demand zone. We're in a bullish trend. If we pull back and we hit the demand zone and bounce from the moving average, it, I don't think it'll correlate in this case, but if they happen to be hitting at about the same time, that's a higher probability for that trade opportunity. So, you know, going back in time, you'll see, wasn't the best example here, but kind of crossed over. We eventually started with a downtrend going on here. And you could see that we have right there, drop, base, drop. Prices came back up, hit both that supply zone and that orange 89 moving average at the same time, and prices dropped from that area. You know, it actually came back a second time. Didn't give you the biggest reward, but it's definitely more than three to one. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, but that's kind of what I'm looking for. I try to keep it simple. Or as I mentioned, um, I use several different services. And I can log into one real quick right here. 324,000 ads blocked on Brandon's page. That's pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's brave. Yeah. Um I'm I'm anyways, a glutton for right punishment. Here. I still use Google. I, 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 uh, I know. Yeah, I, I can't. Okay, great um, resource here. Moore's research is great stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Melissa is really, really nice if you get a hold of them. Um actually if anybody's interested, you can just drop my name and you'll get a 10% discount if you subscribe for the annual. Uh so right here, seasonal spreads. They actually come up with a lot of good spreads there. No, I did not say the trade station was the best. I said the trade station requires you to use the trade station futures plus version in order to be able to trade spreads. And he said, Much what you did say is Thinkorswim is not the best. <clears throat> yes. I, I Like I said, I really enjoy working with Trey over at Trade Pro Futures. I think that he does a very good job. Uh, he knows spreads. Mm-hmm. He knows what's going on there. And he handles a lot of my students and helps them out with their trades. Yeah. And he's Oops. got he's got the best margins that I've seen in the business. Yeah, yeah, Which really is good huge. Too. If you're concerned about the margin requirements, he's actually got some of the best margin rates out there at Trade Pro Futures. Mm-hmm. So this is what I was talking about with seasonal trading. You can see they have seasonal spreads. April's almost over, so I can show you these. But and this shows you right here on the last column, average profit per day and number of days. So that gives you an idea of how long some of the trades will last: 19 days, 25 days, 35 days, 15 days. So not very short, but also not very long. Yeah, some, um, some of them are fairly long. Yeah, 88 days, so almost three months. The, the August feeder cattle and the August live cattle was 78 days. <clears throat> yeah, well, this one's 88. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, so, I mean, some of them could be lasting a while, obviously. Some of them are very short. Where was that one? You said 78 days. It's right above it, right above your, where you got the 88. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right there. Okay, so, yeah, if I go into that one. Basically, what they're doing is they're looking at the last 5, 15, or even up to 30 years and well, the average profit for this one's twenty one hundred dollars, so it may not be too bad to hold on for that long. But you know, you got to be in it for a while, and you can see that they'll give you the historical 
information of how this performed during that time over the last, again, five, 15 or 30 years. So this is a seasonal trade Mm -hmm. where typically during this time frame, that spread happens to rally. We're talking feeder cattle versus live cattle. It says, you said seasonality, man. And for everybody out there, seasonality, there's, there's history behind it. And a lot of times history has a tendency to repeat itself unless it doesn't Uh, on that page just before this, it showed that the average winning trade was like 2,400 bucks, but the average losing trade was $3,900. So that doesn't sound very, there he goes. He's got a highlight right there. 30, sorry, $3,700 is your average loss and 2,100 average win. But You've got 12 winners to every one loser. So in this case, you know, a lot of people will focus on you know, the win-loss ratio. If that's the case, you would think that this trader is absolutely kicking ass because he's winning you know, 12 to 3 is his winners to losers. But because the losers are bigger, it brings down that ratio a little bit, but still averaging um, net profit of 998, not too bad. And that I do not follow this either. They tell you to put in a protective stop. You can see that protective stop is less than two to one reward to risk for the mm-hmm. average. So there's no way I'm going to say that that's something I want to do, right? Yeah. Uh, so when I do these trades, I actually will put in my own stop loss based on things like average true range of the security. You know, we can chart this. It's easy. Feeder cattle versus live cattle. If I go out to, oops, I was on the right page. Sorry. So many things open. It's all good. Anyway, if I go, uh, what are we here? G, uh, GFQ 2023. Uh, that is, I forget the point value. I think that one is 400. That one I don't know. Never traded. Minus feeder cattle. Live cattle <clears throat> times 500. I might have it backward, but anyway, it'll be close. And do that right. What happened here? Yeah, 2023. That does not look like a good chart. Um, <laughs> that it does not. There we go. I don't know what I did. Now let's go back to the daily chart. There we go. I got it now. Oh, you're just anyway, there it is. There's the chart. So this was a what long? Ah, did the wrong thing again. We go back to the trade idea. Buy the August feeder cattle versus live cattle. Okay. And ah, I went to the wrong place again. Sorry. <laughs> tabs, tabs. <clears throat> yeah, so there it is. Uh, that's the chart, and it is moving to the upside. So, you know, do we need to take all the risk that they're talking about, $1,200? Absolutely not. We could take a smaller amount of risk. We can look for, and of course, we can trade based on our technical analysis as well. We can wait for it to pull back to an area of demand. Here it looks like a nice little drop base rally. And now my risk is reduced to uh, about $400 roughly versus $1,200 that they were suggesting. And we actually have. A little divergence where prices rally, but the momentum is dying off a little. So this is probably going to come back. You know, it always says, even on the seasonal trades, enter approximately. You don't have to get in exactly on that day. You want to look for the right opportunities. So when I'm working with my students on these spreads, I'm helping guide them to make sure we're looking for the right times to enter and the right reasons to enter, not just blindly taking the seasonal move because it happens to be, today's the day, we got to get in. Right. (laughs) <clears throat> nice. Well, I, it's, it's nice to have extra resources like that to help you out too. That MRCI yeah. was pretty good. Yeah, Lucy was trying to put her two cents there. Sorry. <laughs> no in worries. The I heard a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So you mentioned uh, classes. You're, I know you, you're teaching all over the place. You've had a few different things going on. What, um, where can we direct people to you to get more information on this? I have your Twitter handle up here, which is at Trader B, as in boy, dub, D U B. So Trader B yeah. dub is the easiest way to. Uh, kind of follow Brendan on social media. He'll be doing some things. I know he does some stuff for wealth builders and e-mini think tank and all that different stuff. So where, where's the best way for people to find you? Uh, one of the easiest things is probably just to email me too. You can hit me up at brandonwendell.cmt at gmail.com. Uh, on YouTube, if you look over my shoulder here, you see it says the Wendell effect. You can search for me. I put out a weekly video on the markets and uh, you can follow me there as well. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the email is probably one of the best ways to get a hold of me there, brandonwendell.cmt at gmail.com. Or, of course, as you mentioned, my Twitter, and I'm sure you put that up. It's I'll on the screen right now. Oh, it is. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I won't bother then. Yeah, save your, save your time. You um, <clears throat> yeah, and he's uh, he's pretty active on Twitter. He's definitely way more active than I am. I am not active pretty much whatsoever unless I'm promoting the show. But um, he gives the different market calls and stock picks and things like that, which I think is also very beneficial. There you go. And Wendy, how much are you auctioning off that picture in the background for? <laughs> My painting? Yeah. Not the uh, Wendell effect logo, no. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I've been uh, the painting that I have that behind me. I actually have uh, copies. I've been selling them. Actually, if anybody wants them, you can email me. Um, been selling them for one hundred fifty dollars each. That's the replica. The actual original I still have. I haven't decided whether I'm going to sell it or not. And I did not turn it into an NFT. People kept asking me I was going to, and then of course the NFTs went diving. So I waited for a bit. But uh, it's such garbage. Because look, dude, you could take <laughs> that picture. And here's the thing with NFTs: they say that the original is going to be destroyed. So unless I physically watch you pour kerosene on the original canvas picture and light it on fire, you're like, oh, I made an NFT of that picture, and you just keep the original in your house. It's just uh, stupidity, Friday. Yeah. But you so, should. You should yeah. have a little numbered labeled series, you know, change the color scheme. You know, it's funny, um, the way you have that picture laid out, do you know the way they do these big NFTs like Bored Apes is they have like seven to ten layers, and one would be the layer for the glasses, one would be the layer for the nose, one's the layer for the mouth, one's the layer for the hair. And on the hair layer, it's like it puts hats and, you know, fedoras and coppolas and baseball hats, um, and they have all these layers, and they literally hit a button, and it just outputs 10,000 randomly generated pictures that include different layers on every one. You right. could take that same picture, make NFTs out of it, but every colored layer, you make the colors different every time. So True. that way there would never be a, uh, a duplicate and you have all these original one-of-a-kind bull and bear NFTs. Just throw it out there for you, kid. I get one for that. free sure, for my thoughts. Not? I mean, yeah. the original is an acrylic on canvas and it's, um, I can't remember what size it is. I think it's, I don't know, it's laying around over here. I got a lot of different art that I've done over the years and yeah. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Well, well, we'll we'll follow you when you get the NFTs done. We'll do your NFT drop on the Trader Merlin show. There you go. That sounds good. <clears throat> all right. So if you guys want to know more from Brandon, I got his lower third on the screen right now, which is Twitter. It's at Trader B Dub. He had his email up there as well, which I didn't write down, but uh... no. <laughs> it's just my name, Brandon Wendell dot CMT at gmail dot com. There you go, Brandon Wendell dot CMT at gmail dot com. <clears throat> See, I'm all, my head's all cloudy today, man. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you got to get some rest. Get I do. I'm, I'm going to finish this going right to bed. Um, all right, man. Well, hey, thank you so, so much for coming on today. I appreciate a little bit of insights into the spread trading. I, I think it's one that a lot of people will find rather complicated initially. But as with anything, I think the more that you apply something, the more that you practice it, the clearer it gets. Uh, and I like the fact that you don't have to put up a lot of capital to do spread trading. So, you know, that's one thing. Reason one reason people like to go look at forex markets or futures markets because that leverage aspect but uh you you get a large part of that here with the spread betting as well spread betting no, <laughs> no. spread trading spread, spread betting, spread betting a completely different animal <laughs> <laughs> that is gambling <laughs> yeah that is all right brandon well hey thank you very much i appreciate you coming on today and i'll get you back on here soon thanks i right. appreciate it love it love coming on here it's a lot of fun to see you again Talk it is again. well hopefully i'll get over there in florida one of these days we're gonna do a live show yeah that'd be awesome right from the beach <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. All right, man. Take care. Have a good day. Hey, you too. All right, bye. And yeah, that was Brandon Wendell. He's got quite a few ways to get in touch with him. As I mentioned, you can go to his Twitter feed, which is at Trader B Dub. That's probably the easiest way. As Margaret has seen some of his videos, Brandon likes to do a <clears throat> a weekly video. I actually was on one of his shows on the Wendell Effect, which you can go. It's weird. You type in the Wendell Effect, but it comes up as the Trader Mindset channel. So it's this bad boy right here. Um, and there you go. Find out more stuff. Always, always good stuff with Brandon. Anyway, all right, let me dive into a little bit what happened out there today just so I can wrap things up here and then I need to go lay down because my fever is not doing so hot. Work our way from the bottom here from a technical perspective. Russell 2000, 2.48% slide. Uh, that's our 15. Check out the daily. I actually, one of my accounts was going to, I thought about selling some puts on the Russell today, but I'm just going to hold off. I think you might see some more downside movement tomorrow um, in the Russell. Now, you're going to have a saving grace for the market tomorrow. Before we dive into indexes individually, let's just look at real quick Google, which reported earnings after hours and it's up 3.81%. So for those that are long the NASDAQ, you're probably going to get bailed out by Google and Microsoft tomorrow. This is Google's earnings announcement. You can see the whipsaw effect, not the Wendell effect, but the whipsaw effect. This thing, right as it closed, was trading right around 104.66. Actually, that's what it was trading at. Dropped all the way down to, uh, dropped $3.15, so a $3 decline. And then from there, shot up to a peak. So the distance between its low and its high on this bad boy in a period of five minutes was 8.94% on 
Google. Uh, right now it's up about 3.81%, but that that's one biggie. Here's the other biggie, which I think is bigger, just because of its market capitalization. Microsoft doing really well. It actually didn't even have any downside movement here. It's like a couple cents of downside, and then shot up a total of about 5.72% in five minutes, and now presently up 5.1%. So that's really gonna help out. You can check out the NASDAQ futures here. Uh, <clears throat> an ugly day for the futures overall, but now all of a sudden recouping some of those losses right here. Crazy, NASDAQ likes 15 minutes. Also broke the daily range. Yes, sir. Uh, not sure if RC can recover if balance sheet losses exceed. I know, I know, Big Eb. And that's got me a little concerned, obviously, FRC. I, I, I knew we were going to sell off today. I didn't think we'd be down 49%. At one point, we were down 51% on FRC today, and that's coming on the heels of yesterday's losses as well. So it's been a uh, uh, pretty brutal pretty brutal couple days for First Republic, but i uh, not so concerned about it. The good news for me anyway is for the past couple of months, I've been selling weekly premium on FRC and making incredible gains with that premium. Now, of course, I'm probably going to give a lot of that back, but I still got to wait and see what happens uh, by Friday because that's when these options expire, but I have a feeling I'll take a pretty good hit <clears throat> on those when we get expiration on Friday because you know I got the 12s and the 11. We're a long ways away from that at this point, <clears throat> but Going back to our overall markets, you can see the triple Qs, right? Getting a little bit of a pop in that after hour session as well. So all in all, things looking pretty darn good. At one point it was down 1.98%. Now it's already bounced up almost 1% in the after hour session. That's just because of Google and Microsoft. Of course, I'm showing you, uh, there you go. That's the, the chart there. Um, so I think that'll help out our NASDAQ tomorrow, but all in all, Russell 2000 probably gonna continue to look weak. Can you explain a little bit about uh, 889? You were mentioning uh, that's actually Brandon's philosophy, right? So Brandon uses an eight period moving average and an 89 period moving average um, as a way for confirming trades and putting you and creating buying opportunities. But um, I'm not going to go through all the details of that. That's kind of Brandon's thing. You can find out more information. Just tweet, go to Brandon and tweet him. Hey, can you explain the 889 thing? And we see if he does that one there. <clears throat> yeah, someone could step in and buy it. They could. And and again, Big Ed, part of what I was hanging my hat on with FRC was. JP Morgan, Bank of America, and 11 other banks already put in $30 billion. And I cannot fathom that JP Morgan or Bank of America or these 11 other banks would dump money in there if they thought this thing was going under. They clearly have looked at the numbers. They have to have. There's just no way that would happen. Unless I'm insane and, I, and I'm reading this totally wrong. Uh, here's FRC. Th that's why I was more aggressive on those puts than I normally would have been. Wow, look at that chart. Ooh, yeah, 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 that's bad. Oof. That's really ugly. Plus, we were basing, right? So I had this long basing sideways factor, uh, factor to it. I had the bailout opportunity from some of these other banks. It just felt like, yeah, it's still hurting, but not going to go under. Um, but yeah, you might you might get someone else to bail to bail them out. I, I don't think that they're going to be going bankrupt. <clears throat> you know, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think it's the end for First Republic, but I, I'm I've been wrong at least over the past two days on FRC. For the past month, I've been pretty correct and loving the premium. But uh, as bad as it seems right now, it's actually not that bad for me given the premium that I've been collecting week over week over week. But uh, we'll see what happens by Friday. <clears throat> yeah, today was definitely, you don't see that too often now, 49% in a day, yowzas. Uh, let me run through some of these other ones. So you can see there are a few others that got hit pretty hard today. Uh, da -da -da. NTRS, Northern Trust Company got smacked. You have AMP got smacked down 7%. So a lot of these banks got hit. You know, you look at the upside, there wasn't much in that banking index that was doing good. You've got Bro, kind of a great Brown and Brown, Bro. You've got um, Moody's Corporation. Maybe they got paid a bunch of money for that downgrades they did on those 11 banks yesterday. Can you put on a trade so we could see how it looks like, please? Oh, I'm not going to make a trade, uh, Si. The markets are closed. Well, not the markets closed, but you would simply go here to your moving averages. And you would add on, let's go to an eight. And I'm not sure if I can do another one on here. Let's see if it allows me to do, I don't pay a subscription to this, but we'll go technicals and we'll do moving average. I don't think it's gonna allow me to do another one. Okay. And we'll change that one. Set, change the settings on this and I'll make it, there's an 89. So he's looking at these two moving averages, not only for crossovers to keep you on the right side of things. Let me make sure this is the eight. Yeah. 
but using them as buying opportunities if these things line up with supply and demand zones. That's the, the general gist of it. But if you want the actual strategy, go to Brandon Wendell. You can check him out at, at Trader B-Dub on Twitter. Um, I can show you that Twitter handle there real quick. Let me put it up for you guys. Here's his Twitter handle. So if you tweet out to at Brandon Wendell, or at Trader B-Dub, he will uh, answer you there. And he's got more followers than me. I'm going to catch up with Brandon. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, okay, let's go back to the market so I can get through the top seven and I need to go lay down and maybe watch some sporting events. But uh, from the market perspective, you had your worst performer out there was the Russell. Crude oil was a close second down 2.15%. Um, as Pepe says, and this is for you, Cy, he says uh, 889 is a lagger. All moving averages are lagging. So if an eight period is a short-term lagging indicator, think of how lagging an 89 is. So they're not really designed to be triggers per se, they're designed to be assistance. So for example, you look at this uh, CL right now, these crude oil futures, it's sitting right on this 89 period moving average, but that eight is drifting down. That's obviously becoming much more bearish, but we could have called that right here when we broke below the most recent lows of 7903, right? That would be the, the real, okay, now we're closing that gap. Uh, I personally think you're gonna keep drifting lower here on crude oil and close this gap ultimately. Uh, if that does happen, I'll be looking to be a buyer of crude oil, probably down around 73. Uh, that was your one of your worst performers today, down 2.15%. S&P was 1.59% slide. What's bad about the S&P, let me get these moving averages off here because I don't like moving averages, they're old. <clears throat> Does not work well in the box. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so the boxes are easier, right? It took me a couple years to put the plane naked trading. Yeah. Did I have a say? Did I have a hand in that, Pepe? Because I always encourage people go naked trade. There, there was a company called Trade Naked, but like your charts should be pretty naked. You know, you look here. Um, these charts are not naked. I have a price level here, which I can get rid of that. I had these downtrending lines, which uh, was violated. It actually felt rather like we're starting to become more optimistic, and then it just didn't about face. And I have the uptrend line here. So I keep those ones on. That yellow box to me is somewhat irrelevant at this point. I'll just get rid of that one. Uh, but yeah, I try to keep them as simple as possible and not with all those lines and indicators on it. You see here, this actually has grid lines on it. I personally don't even like to have grid lines on my charts. So we can go up here. I think I can go to settings. And I can, let's go appearance and let's get rid of grid lines. But I just, I don't even like grid lines, none. Now look at the chart. Now the price levels have to speak to me. Sometimes your eyes get drawn to those uh, grid lines. Well, here now I'm forcing my eyes to look at what the chart is telling me. Hey, Frank, good to see you. <clears throat> is the latest, is the last candle on MCO a shooting star? MCO. Yes, it is. Now, it is, so it's, it's a great question, DC. It is a shooting star, but there's, there's levels of shooting star. It's like, in the world of modeling, you would say, is this a model? Okay, yeah, it's, if it's a, an attractive lady, you'd say, or man or woman, you'd say, that's a bad example. Um, is this a basketball player, right? And the guy's you know 5'8", and he's got decent stats. He's a basketball player, but is he, you know, 6'9", LeBron James, who, you know, best scorer in the history of the game. Very different gradients there with regards to what that definition of player is. So in this example, I want you to think of the word player in that basketball analogy I just made. That player is the candlestick, and they're not all created equal. This candlestick by, is actually a great one, great shooting star by itself. It, this is awesome, and obviously a huge topping tail in this one. What I don't like is it's not really after a strong, aggressive uptrend, right? If this is a much steeper rally into this candle, the shooting star today, then I would feel much better about it. Granted, it has been slowly moving up, right? And now you have the shooting star. I like this hammer formation from back on the 10th of April better because you had a rally, you had a sell-off, and as it was selling off for three days straight, fairly aggressively, you had a hammer formation coming into an area of demand. That's better. While I like the shooting star, it's not an amazing one because it's not really after a very strong rally up in price. Now, that said, could you trade this short tomorrow? Yeah. Here's the rules for it is short. If it, if it opens up above 305.34, then you're, you're, the trade could potentially happen. If it opens up above 305.34 and then starts to fall below that number tomorrow, that's your shorting opportunity. And that's as simple as I can possibly make it. And those are one, some of my simple rules there. Um, I just use full supply and demand analysis, all time frames, look for certain patterns. Yep, exactly, same thing. 
How about Starbucks? But now we're on the now. You guys, I was just gonna try to get out of here and go lay down. You're gonna make me sick more. Okay, this one's better. So this is great. Uh, DC started it. Dave, you continued on. I like this. This is actually a better example because you have three really strong up days in a row and it's been after a fairly long uptrend. Um, I would rather that we didn't see these two red candles on April 18th and 19th, but shooting star on Starbucks right now, there's your low, 108.83. Again, if it opens up above that and then starts to sell off below it, I think you got a good trade there. You could, you know, you could short these things at any time if you want. It's just I'm setting rules in to avoid chasing or being emotional or jumping onto a trade because a lot of people may look at this specific uh, candle today on Starbucks and go, oh my God, it's, it's a shooting star, it's gonna fall. No, it absolutely does not mean that. You know what, it, when it's gonna fall is if it actually starts falling. So that's what I'm using this line for saying, if we open up above this red dotted line at 108.83 and then start to fall, then I feel that momentum might still be there. And who knows? I mean, you could see this thing fall fairly dramatically. Have you heard about magnets or older Block trading, any thoughts? Um, no, I, I'm not sure I quite understand what you're talking about there, Pepe. I mean, I know what block trading is. Block trading actually used to be a company, um, but block trading is really what day traders did back in the day. We trade big blocks of, uh, you know, 1,000 shares or more at a time. Let's see. And it hit supply. Oh, I didn't look at supply. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, you kind of right near the upper. You actually went outside that upper supply, but yeah. So that gives it more validity, right? <clears throat> I was up to I missed it. <laughs> Dang it, don't you hate when that happens, Dave? <laughs> uh, big guy, I saw you mention something here. Uh, if that CL drop continues another day or two, it's put options selling time. You know, it's funny, Big Ab, I actually had orders today to sell and then I canceled them right away. I, I, was, I wanted to do XLE today, <clears throat> but it's weird. Even on a day like today when the markets are down 2% kind of across the board, I didn't see great premium. So I have the 82s marked out here, but you know, if you look at how close the 82s are, and I was looking at the... <clears throat> uh, May 19th, it's only 3% lower. I mean, this thing fell 1.62% today. That's that's two days at current volatility. I have this feeling, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're going to see more downside movement here over the next couple days. If it closes this gap, then I'll be selling puts, and I might even do them at the money at 182, but we'll, we'll wait and see what happens when you get there. Uh, obviously, I have a little bit of, of uh, damage control to do with that FRC by Friday. Uh, the good news is no one has exercised those shares on FRC, so I haven't been forced to buy them yet. <laughs> Uh, you know, we could we could see a bounce, uh, which is what I'm anticipating. But of course, I might be biased. All right, uh, we we almost made it to the top here. I got to the S and P. There's your Nasdaq with 1.89 percent slide, but that's now popping up because of what went with Google and Microsoft after hours. Hello, John. Uh, here's your Dow. <clears throat> I can get rid of some of these lines here. That can go away. This one can go away. So I'm back to naked charts with the Dow. You know, the only positive thing I see here at the Dow right now, obviously, is its overall strength, but you are coming into this area where it had two kind of sideways consolidation days in a row, which is just about where we're going to hit tomorrow. So let's let's wait and see uh, how that one hits tomorrow. Gold was actually up 0.24%. I was looking at selling some silver today, but I didn't, selling some puts on silver, but I did not. Um, I am currently in the 22s, and I would want to sell some more of the 22s on SLV. <clears throat> I do need rest, get to it. I had 103 fever last night. It was not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. Uh, Bitcoin, 0.75% move to the upside here today. No big deal. I mean, you look at the candle, it's just stuck in the middle of that range, that yellow box. So no big deal here. I, what I don't want to see happen with Bitcoin is I don't want to see it drop below 26,666. That would be the bad one. Uh, let's see. Do -do -do, the yellow box on XLE. Let's go X to the LSD. Uh, you want to put one in there? Is that what you're saying? Because, you know, we could argue that this overhead supply zone is still in play, right? We could argue that, but you could also contend, and Margaret, correct me if, the, if this is what you're referencing, you know, you could almost look at it as we have a, a bigger yellow box of sideways kind of on top of that. So obviously I'm looking at the overhead supply is between 86.76 and 87. So you got a dollar, 87.77. So about a dollar worth of risk there is your overhead supply zone. But the overall range seems to just be bouncing between um, 8420 and 8777. So we could keep both those on there. I probably want to change one of them just so it doesn't get confusing. Let me see if I can change this bad boy over here. We'll change that style, make that box red. I'm hoping that this is red. Oh, that's outline. Nope, I don't want to do that. And let's go there and we'll go to the background and we'll make it red. There you go. 
So we'll leave those there just like that, just for time being, uh, Margaret. Yeah, I agree. You have that overall supply zone uh, and the range bound action going on with, with XLE. Again, I am of the opinion that we're going to break down below it, but <clears throat> I've been pretty wrong lately, so we'll have to wait and see. Okay, let me go through <clears throat> some pieces of information that were really important. It, you know, with all this doom and gloom about the banking stocks, I think it's interesting to look at the news that came out today. This was some really good news. Um, look here. New home sales. They're expecting it to go from 623 to 633. We came out at 683,000 new homes sold. That's 50,000 more than expectation and 60,000 more than the previous month. That's really good. That means that people are buying it. And we know that the yields have dropped on the 10 year, right? At least uh, for the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Let me go out here to this, bring up your 10 year so you can see that. <clears throat> so I got so many things on my watch list now. You know, you've, you've witnessed this. 10-year bond just slowly drifting down. I was kind of thinking we would, let's get rid of this line. I was kind of thinking we'd have see a little bit of a surge here. Uh, that was back in February, and we did, and then just gave it all back. So the more that this drops, uh, the more this drops, the cheaper that 30-year fixed rate mortgage gets, and that could be helping new home sales. Plus, I was listening to some expert out there, and he's talking about all of the the perks and incentives that you know Toll Brothers and Lennar and KB Homes are giving now for uh, new home purchases. So that's that's very good from an economy perspective. Really good. The other part up here, which is really good as well, is you know you had let's go there. Dot. You had 2.6 percent year over year growth for composite 20 home price index. They had thought there was going to be a decline of negative 0.1. We came out at 0.4. So while it's still dropping it's still positive. I, I think that those are two very good pieces of data that came out. Of course, you can see sandwiched in between there, we have the Richmond Manufacturing Index, which came out more negative, but that's not really that big of a deal. Um, so housing prices still increasing and new home sales really surging. That is a very positive sign for the day. Um, already went through some of the earnings. <clears throat> Here's our earnings calendar for today. What happened? Microsoft, they beat earnings and had a nice pop in the after hour session. You also had Google down there in the middle of the page. They beat earnings as well, not by much. They expected 106, came out at 117, uh, and they were up, uh, what, probably about 5% in the after hours. Now, not everybody won here. Illumina, General Motors, McDonald's, uh, GE, all were down, even though they all beat on earnings. Illumina tripled their earnings and was down 3%. McDonald's, which has, again, one of the best looking charts that you're going to see in a long time, especially over the last uh, couple of months. Check out this right here. Here's McDonald's looking fantastic. It was down 0.58% today and uh, a little bit up in the after hour session, but the earnings on them was great maybe just not in line with what the expectations were. Um, you got Google, Alphabet, Visa, so a lot of good stuff reporting earnings today. What's happening for tomorrow? Well, let me check you out. There you go. Here's your economic counter for tomorrow. I'm going to start with the U.S. Durable goods orders. They're expecting a nice pop in durable goods orders as well as wholesale inventories. They're expecting that to stay about the same. You also have uh, on your earnings calendar more popcorn trades of the day. Let's get that graphic popping. Popcorn trade of the day. Oh, pop, pop, pop. Like my theatrical accompaniment there. Uh, Meta, that's right, Meta. Facebook will be reporting earnings after market closes. You also have after market close will be ServiceNow, uh, American Tower, Automatic Data Processing, Boeing, and Thermo Fisher Scientific will be doing announcements before the market opens. What side do you use to check your earnings announcements? So I put that on here. It's, it's Zax.com. You can see over here. Uh, there's multiple, uh, Malcolm. I use multiple sites, but generally these pages are taken from Zax.com, as you can see uh, on the slide here. It's quoting that one out. Um, the worst news we had today is that Biden and Harris are running, and you know, well, I'm not going to make this political, Pepe. No, no, we're not going down politics. <laughs> uh, you know, there is a funny movie out there. I'm a big fan of Richard Pryor. I think Richard Pryor is one of the best stand-up comedians ever. Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever seen Richard Pryor live at Sunset Strip. Uh, he did one of the funniest intros ever, and in, in context, it's so silly and dumb, but the crowd is going, they introduce him, Richard Pryor, and Richard Pryor comes on the stage, and the crowd is standing ovation, just going crazy, <sighs> and as they kind of die down, he just looks around the room, and he goes, man, I sure hope I'm funny. I don't know why, but I think that's one of the funniest things a comedian could say as he comes on stage. It's like, man, the expectation has been set here uh, with Richard Pryor. Anyway, Richard Pryor did a movie called Brewster's Millions. And the premise of the movie was he inherited something like $100 million or $500 million. And he had to spend, he inherited $100 million, 
but if he spent it all within like 30 days, he gets 500 and he can't tell anybody why he's spending it, which is an interesting kind of storyline because he's got all this money and he's literally, he's doing everything he can to spend this money. And everybody's like, no, you can't do this. Stop blowing your money. You're going to lose it all. And he's like, I want to do this. Anyway, he spends all this money, but his, one of the ways he spends a lot of money is campaigning and his campaign is for none of the above where it's like, I don't want to vote for anybody. They're all bad. They're all garbage. There's nobody good to vote for. So don't vote for anybody on the ballot. And that was his whole platform out there. Would be, I'd like to see none of the, uh, none of the above as a box on the ballot, but unfortunately that would just make my, vo my vote not count. Yeah, Richard Pryor would be canceled these days. You know what's funny is his early stuff, I think, would be canceled. He was very graphic and uh, he liked to drop a specific word almost every other sentence that, you know, I think is one of the worst words in, in the human language. Um, but once he, he, he actually went to Africa and he came back and he had a whole new respect for the culture and changed his whole comedic routine. But yeah, he's great. Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, the best comedian is Robin Williams, obviously. All right, uh, that's going to do it for me for today. I was really planning on doing a 30-minute show today, and here we are at 57 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> you know what? It's not that I have a great movie memory. I have memory of things I really remember and enjoy. Like that movie, Brewster's Millions, it's, it's so funny. You should go watch it. It's, it's comical. It's silly. It's dumb, but it's got great Richard Pryor comedy in it, and I like the storyline. Imagine someone gives you, let's just even say a million dollars, and you have to spend that within 30 days. And if you spend it without anybody knowing, you get $10 million. That would be fun. Anyway. <clears throat> yes, it was, Yowza. Yes, it was. The Coke comedian. Yeah. What is Richard Pryor got burned by Pepsi? I oh, know. Michael Jackson got burned by Pepsi. Richard Pryor got burned by Coke. Is that what it was? But I'm dumb. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for me, guys. I'm going to wrap things up here. Uh, if you enjoyed today's show, tradermerlin at gmail.com is the email to let me know uh, that you liked it. But really, if you, if you have things you want to comment on the show put them down below the youtube video that's the best way i did not look at the comments yesterday because i was literally laying in bed uh but for tomorrow's show i'm probably going to build it off of what you guys talk about so uh put your comments down below the youtube video let me know what things you want to talk about you can email me for anything else and, and check out brandon on twitter it's at trader b dub would be the way to get a hold of him that said hope you guys have a fantastic remainder of your day let's hope for a little bounce in frc and i'll see you guys tomorrow take care